Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this worship service for Island Baptist Church on February the 21st. Hard to believe that this month is getting close to the end, but I'm glad that you've joined us today. Thank you for spending the time on this Sunday morning or whenever you're watching this video. We are hoping that if cases of coronavirus continue to go down here in Hong Kong, we'll be able to resume our public gatherings, our worship services together, and we'll keep you posted about that. But until then, we have our messages brought online onto YouTube. And also, if we are able to get back together, for those of you who can't be with us because of travels or quarantine, we're also hoping to have the videos live streamed as well. But thank you for taking the time to do this. I hope you'll also be watching the Sunday school services. I'm really blessed to have Pastor Matt sharing those with us. And then also to any of the worship services that are put online or linked in the PDFs that we send out to our church members. Hope you'll also follow along in that way and worship the Lord in your hearts as well. Let's go ahead and pray and worship the Lord now. Thank him for what he's done and ask him to help us during this worship service hour. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for allowing us to come before you in prayer as Christians with confidence that you will hear us, that you'll receive our requests and our petitions because of what your son Jesus Christ has done in securing our position before you. Father, we thank you that not because of anything that is in us or anything that we have done, you've received us and you've accepted us, but you've done that, Lord, in Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we thank you so much for that wonderful gift of salvation in him. Father, I pray also today, if anyone who is listening, who has attended Island Baptist Church, or they've been listening to the YouTube services, as they hear your word, that their hearts and their consciences would be pricked, and Lord, that they would desire to know you as their Savior. They would confess their sins to you and trust you as their Savior, so that they too can come before you boldly in prayer with great confidence. And Father, for us who are Christians, Lord, although our lives have been changed and our schedules have been altered and the things we like to do um, adjusted, Father, we thank you that we can always come to you in prayer as we do now. And Father, that we have this constant line of access before you. And Father, may we as Christians during this unusual season of separation from brothers and sisters in Christ, some of us not being able to get together as frequently as we would like, Father, we ask that you would make us more faithful in prayer and that you would help us to lift each other up before your throne of grace and mercy. Lord, do bless us during this hour as we look at the life of Moses. We ask that you would teach us both by his victories and also, Lord, by his mistakes. We want to learn the lesson that Paul said the Old Testament teaches, that we can learn by their example so that we will imitate what is good, but also, Lord, avoid what is bad. So show us today, not only in his life, but show us in our life, Lord, the things that need to be changed to be more uh, in accordance with your will and more pleasing in your sight. We pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today we are going to be continuing our series of the life of Moses. And if you've got your Bibles, I'd like you to go ahead and turn with me to Exodus chapter 4. Now, we're actually going to spend just a little time in chapter 3, but Lord willing, we're going to make it all the way through the beginning of chapter 7 today. Now, if you've been with us for our other messages and our other lessons, you will know that usually we like to go verse by verse as we study the Word of God, especially in the New Testament. But in our Old Testament series, often we have to slow down, especially in these narratives, um, and, and look at the story as a whole. So as I say slow down, we really speed up in terms of how many chapters and verses we cover. And so today, whenever you see on the screen chapter 4, 5, 6, and 7, I want to encourage you, go back on your own time, and read those chapters. You'll find these stories, these narratives are, are very easy to read and enjoyable. So do go back and read these chapters in your Bible. But as you can see from the screen, the title of the lesson today is The Making of a Meek Man. Those of you who are uh, familiar with your Bibles, you'll know that Moses was called the meekest man on the earth. We'll see some stories about his meekness as the lessons go on. But what I'm trying to suggest by our title is God was in the process, as we're going to read today, of making Moses into the man that he was supposed to be, that he needed to be, that God wanted him to be. Now, the picture on the screen may seem unusual for this. I'm sorry that my, my picture blocks off Pharaoh's head. But this is, of course, the scene where Moses and Aaron will cast the staff down, and the staff, as God had demonstrated already, turns into a snake, a serpent. 
And we see this situation, and maybe in your mind, you think of this as a scene where Pharaoh is going to be very impressed, and Pharaoh is going to begin to think about letting the people of God go. But actually, in the story, as we'll be reminded today, the magicians of Egypt, they cast their staffs down as well. And the story, this part that we see here, doesn't exactly work out as you and I might think. It doesn't have the result, perhaps, that Moses wanted. And so what we're going to find out today is that God is going to use some difficulties in the life of Moses. And I believe this is part of what's going to make him the man that he's supposed to be. Now, really, there's been a, a theme in the last two messages and this third message of how God was providentially using his power to really mold Moses into the person that he desired him to be. Uh, when we talk about this idea of God making Moses who he wanted him to be, we saw, first of all, God had spared him. You'll remember this from our first lesson, how God had miraculously, in the midst of really a, a genocide, in the midst of murder of lots of the Hebrew children, that God had rescued Moses. Not only did he rescue him in that way, but he also was preparing him by allowing him to be in a position of great power in that household of the Egyptian royalty. Then as well, we saw last week how God in his mercy also separated him from that worldly, cosmopolitan, rich and fancy, well-educated life and put him out into the desert where he had this encounter with God. We're going to see that again a little bit today. But today what I want to say to you is I also think God allowed Moses to be brought through struggles, through difficulties, through challenges. And some of these we're going to see are challenges that God arranged. They were challenges that God allowed, trials in Moses' life. But some of the challenges and struggles early on are Moses' own fault. And this is one of the great things we're going to see today as we, when we close our lesson, is that whether it be your mistake, my mistakes, your sins and your failures and my sins and my failures, or whether it be frustrations that God allows, and disappointments that God arranges and appoints for us, whatever those may be, God is able to grow us into the men and women that he wants us to be, even through the struggles in our life. So this is what we're going to see. And to get this picture, we've got to take these chapters together so that you get an impression of how Moses goes from difficulty to difficulty to difficulty to difficulty before there's any sign of a tremendous victory in his life. So just to recap as we begin this, remember the first set of struggles Moses uh, has as we meet him is internal struggles. This is going to be a little bit of a re review from last week. We're not going to uh, read all the verses or the chapter again, but even in chapter three, we saw this already. So if you, if you missed it, go back and watch the other message from the last week, but more importantly, read this chapter in your Bible. First of all, there was a lack of understanding, we said last week. And the good news is, if we lack understanding about God, about who He is and His Word, what His desires are for us, what His plans are for us, the good news is, if we'll ask and pursue it, speaking to God in prayer, going to God in His Word, getting godly counsel, as I said last week, God welcomes that. God does not fault you, young Christians, for being ignorant as long as you are working to get more understanding, to get more knowledge, to pursue a better knowledge of who God is and a closer relationship with Him. God says that for those who desire to draw near to God, God will draw nigh. He'll draw near to them. He encourages that. God assures Moses and you and me in that case. By the way, sinner friends, if you're listening and you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, the same thing goes for you. You say, well, I would like to know him. I, I want to become a Christian. I want to be sure my home is in heaven. I want to be sure my sins are forgiven, but I'm not sure. Friends, that's nothing to be ashamed of. I mean, even if you've been putting on a show, even if you've been pretending and you've been assuring people, no, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. Listen, it is much better for you to make sure to get a true understanding. The Bible says in the New Testament that the New Testament and the Gospels has been written so that you can know for sure that you are a child of God. So let me encourage you, pursue him. There's no fault in that, but it is a struggle. Not understanding is something that's unnerving. 
And in chapter three, Moses had said to God, after God had introduced himself in the burning bush, Moses says, well, who are you? How can I tell the people of God who you are? And you'll remember God had said to Moses, I am that I am. Tell them I am that I am. I'm the God of their fathers, their ancestors. I'm the God who sees them. And I'm the God who has a plan for the future. So Moses struggled knowing who God was and what he should tell people. God gave him assurance and details. Also, he said, how are we going to do this? How are you going to liberate the people through me? He wanted God to explain, or, or really we see that God gives a demonstration of his power because God lets him throw the staff down. It turns into a serpent. He puts his hand into his bosom and it comes out leprous. And he even tells him about changing the water into blood. So again, God in his patience says, I'll tell you more about myself. I will show you my power and I'll encourage you that you're going to be able to do this with my help. So God revealed himself and his power, even though Moses had a lack of understanding. And again, friends, let me encourage you. Maybe your struggle is similar to this. You're not quite sure about your, maybe your spiritual standing with the Lord. Maybe you're not sure about his desires for you, what his will is for your life. You're not quite sure about how you should live, how you should behave as a Christian. Listen, let me encourage you. I know it's challenging, but God desires to enlighten you. He desires to tell you more about himself. He desires to show you the way that you should walk in. As you seek his face in prayer, as you seek his wisdom and his word, he is more than willing to show you. He delights in that, in fact. By the way, one of the reasons why God delights in this is because it's the attitude of a humble person. A humble person who says, Lord, I don't know. You know, if you're the kind of person who thinks you know everything, that's something that cuts you off from this type of assurance. All right. So Moses's first internal struggle is he doesn't understand and praise the Lord. God in his patience gives him assurance and encouragement. Now, as we go on from this lack of understanding where God provides assurance, the next one is not so good on Moses's part. Now we're going to see there is a lack of obedience. Moses may have had the proper amount of humility, but Moses also had a natural amount of stubbornness. Okay, so you'll notice what I say here on the screen. In the first case, a lack of understanding is met with God's assurance, but a lack of obedience from Moses and for you and me as well is met with God's anger. Now, I said this before. I have uh, you know, beloved Christian friends and others who, who don't think God ever gets angry. He doesn't ever get sad. He doesn't ever get disappointed. Um, now, some of them think that because they magnify God's love. Some of them think that because they're confused in theology and think God doesn't ever have emotions. But the Bible says God was angry with Moses. I sometimes preach a message from Proverbs on how to make God mad. The Bible says there are things that God hates. There are things that make God angry. And yes, even as a Christian, though our position is secure in Jesus Christ, and we have that assurance, you can still be disappointing in your actions to God. So this is, we would say, a place for us to remember the proper fear of the Lord, as Pastor Matt's been sharing on Wednesday nights and, and some Sundays as well. So what does Moses do with this lack of obedience? Well, if you look in your Bibles, we talked about this before, and we will pause for a moment uh, to see this verse again. You remember after God had revealed himself, said who he was, demonstrated his power, then Moses at the very end, and, and again in our Bibles it's very polite, Moses says this, verse 13 of chapter 4. Moses said, O oh my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. In other words, Moses says, Lord, send anybody you want, but don't send me. That's the implication. He says, Lord, that's fine. You're the great God of our fathers. You've got a wonderful plan. Surely save your people, but do it through somebody else. Don't send me. So here's the first lack of obedience was Moses's refusal to accept God's call. He was not willing to commit. He, he was all for saving the people. He desired to do that himself. You remember when he was there in Egypt, he was trying to be a referee or a judge over those Hebrews. He tried to rescue them by fighting off and killing an Egyptian taskmaster. 
But now when God tells him the way that he desires to do it, Moses is not willing to commit. Now, again, to give Moses credit, perhaps his humility, perhaps his view of his own inability is what's causing him to do that. You know, all through these chapters, chapter four, five, six, seven, Moses will say things like, I don't have circumcised lips. My, my mouth and my tongue is not so good. He wasn't very confident. But you remember the problem was the disobedience and the failure was God had said, I'll be with your mouth. I'll be with your lips. I'll be with your tongue. I'll go with you. I'll demonstrate my power. He had been reassured and Moses wasn't willing to commit. Now, friends, again, listening, I think you can make the application as well. When God calls you to something, whether it be salvation for you unbelievers or sanctification, growing in holiness for you Christians, doing some kind of service for God, giving some kind of gift, uh, helping someone in some way, growing in your walk with God, you need to be willing to do it. Uh, you don't want to have the attitude of Moses and say, Lord, that sounds great, but for somebody else, not me. That's we see here something that made God angry. It says in verse 14, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. Now, praise God, he reassures Moses here and he doesn't throw him away. I know there have been many times in my life, no doubt in yours, where God has been disappointed or angry with me or you, but he has not destroyed us. He has not cast us aside. Why is that? Because God is merciful and long-suffering not willing that any should perish, and he's very, very patient. Let me add some little note, too, as well, for maybe you parents, those who are you in spiritual leadership, sometimes you have disappointment and anger with those who are under you, and you might say, well, it's righteous indignation. Yes, but as my father always said to me <laughs> with his grandkids, in wrath, remember mercy. God is very merciful even in the midst of his anger. Now, Moses, as we go on, I'm going to skip ahead in this story and tell you what happens. Moses finally surrenders to the will of the Lord. God had said, Aaron is coming to meet you. Aaron's going to help you. I'll be together with you. You to the Egyptians will be in the place of God, and Aaron will be in the place as a spokesperson. So Aaron is coming towards the wilderness. Moses meets him. They celebrate their reunion. They talk about the plans of God. And God had also been encouraging Aaron in this way. So Moses goes to his family, his new family. You'll remember Jethro, the priest of Midian, to his wife Zipporah, their great uh, family that they had there. And they decide that uh, they're going to go to Egypt as a family. Now, Moses knew he was called, but Moses says to Jethro, his father-in-law, I need to go back to my brethren in Egypt. I'm going to see if they're alive. We don't know if he told him the full story, but Jethro says to Moses, go in peace. And so as Moses and Zipporah and perhaps Aaron go back to Egypt, there's something unusual that happens. There's a, a very unusual part of the story. Now, Moses is, is reminded by God, you're supposed to go to Egypt and, and listen to this very carefully. Here's what you're supposed to tell them, Moses. Tell Pharaoh, this is in verse 22, thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. They are precious to me. And if you will not let my people go, then I will take your firstborn of the Egyptians. Now that's very scary and terrifying and tragically we're going to see this happens. But God says to Moses, Israel's my precious firstborn. They belong to me. If you won't let them go, I'm going to take your firstborn. Now there's a place in our Bibles which seems like it, it doesn't follow, like a non sequitur, like it comes out of nowhere. Because look in your Bibles, right after this is said, verse 24 comes out of nowhere. And says, and it came to pass by the way in the end, the way back to Egypt, that the Lord met him, that's Moses, and sought to kill him. Now, how many of you have read your Bibles and come across that verse? Uh, I, probably not many of you, but I hope more and more of you as you read your Bible through. Moses is on his way. Zipporah is with him. They've got their children. Aaron perhaps is going as well. And it says God came to kill Moses. And you say, what? Why did God come to kill Moses? Now, we have to read the rest of this uh, short little passage to try and get the hints and the clues as to why. I do think that there's a clear reason why. Verse 25, then Zipporah, this is his wife, 
took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at his feet and said, Surely a bloody husband art thou to me. And so he, that's God or the angel of the Lord that was going to kill him, the angel of death, some have supposed, let him go. And she said again to Moses, A bloody husband thou art because of the circumcision. Now, it's still a, a strange passage, isn't it? So let's try and piece together what's going on here. As they're going into Egypt for Moses to be the one to rescue God's people through the acts and power of God, Moses is nearly killed by God. And what is the thing that allows Moses' life to be spared? Well, his son becoming circumcised. And you say, Pastor, I do not understand. What a strange story. Well, remember this. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the Israelites, they had a special relationship with God. God's covenant with them, his promises with them. This was shown in the life of humanity, in the life of that nation by circumcision. It was a physical act, an outward sign of a relationship with God. And it was something that was supposed to be done to every Israelite baby boy. Now, as that goes on through history, apparently Moses did not do this. Moses did not follow in the tradition of his fathers. He did not obey the commandments of God. He did not do that first primary important act for the Jewish people to say, we belong to God. So what I say on your screen is this is Moses' refusal to act on God's commands. He, he had quite a sense of his own identity as a Hebrew. He knew all that that entailed. He knew all that it meant to be a Jew. And there's very few uh, laws and requirements that were given to the Hebrews at this point. Remember that. Moses is going to be the one used by God to give the law. You know, in John's gospel, it says the law came by Moses. And here is this man who's supposed to be the lawgiver of God, who's supposed to be the representative of God. He's supposed to be the man who leads the Hebrews into a new epoch of their history. And he has not done the most basic requirement of a Hebrew in his family. He did not follow through on the commitments expected of him. And you say, but pastor, really? Is it, was it serious enough for God to kill him? Apparently, yes. And we will see this, by the way, in Exodus, that God in this period will not allow this kind of high-handed, we would say, disregard for his commands. And he says sin in this way and disobedience is very, very important. God was not going to allow Moses to hide and to keep and to really keep secret in his life a sin that others were not allowed to do. To put it in perspective, this kind of sin could have caused the death penalty or the expulsion, the kicking out from uh, Israel of another Jew. And yet Moses and his own family hadn't done it. What a wonderful lesson, by the way, to say for the servants of God, for the leaders in the family of God and among the people of God, that is no reason to expect any less of them. In fact, the standard of anything for them is higher. Their life is narrower. Their requirements are, are more stringent and difficult in many ways. And so God says to Moses, get this right. God wanted to kill Moses in this situation. He was going to kill Moses, we can say. So do you see why I say this is lack of obedience being met with God's anger? And again, you say, Pastor, what does this have to do with the story of Moses? Well, God is preparing him. If he's going to use him, he has to be purged and purified. He has to be the kind of person who does not have these types of sins in his life that would cause him to fail and to be a hypocrite. Now, sadly, I, I, in the last two years, it seems like we've had some big name Christians who have been famous uh, ministers of God and have sadly had sin in their life or sadly turned away from the faith or sadly uh, gone through these very public uh, struggles with immorality or with uh, a lack of faith, hypocrisy there. And you look at it and the damage that it does to Christians who are discouraged, to the world that points and says, look at you hypocrites. God here was not going to allow Moses to have this sin in his life. And God was angry about it. Now, again, Christians, I, I hope 
that this uh, is something that warns you. I hope also that there's nobody listening who says, you know what, I do have secret sins in my life. I have things that I am hiding from others that I think God is just going to allow to let go. No, God is angry with these things. And if you want to be made into the man or woman that God can use, you need to be obedient to his command. So poor Zipporah here, she's the one who has to act. And we don't quite understand exactly the, the phrasing of what she says. It's, by the way, it's, it's not the British type of swear and insult when she talks about Moses, but she's speaking to Moses. And you can see as well, she's recognizing what had to be done, but there's also some anger in her life because of this uh, crazy and terrifying situation that took place. Okay, so here's some internal struggles with Moses. Some of them are, are okay, God assures him, but some of them result in God's anger. For you and for me, wouldn't it be much better for us to learn the lesson from his life instead of go through it ourselves? All right, now that's on the outside, but what about the inside? Again, as we kind of skim over these chapters, let's see the other challenges that Moses had. The first one we're going to see in chapter 5 is what I call the challenge of resentment. Resentment is where somebody is angry at you, bitter at you, and they're upset at you. And, and it can also happen in yourself. You can have this own type of resentment and bitterness. But the situation that I describe is things go wrong when you do what is right. You, you tried to obey God. You tried to follow his word and things didn't work out. And that can lead to resentment on your part. But also here, Moses has to face it from other people. So Moses and Aaron afterwards, it says in verse one, went in and told Pharaoh. This is after they told the people of Israel all the things. By the way, when they told the people of Israel what was going to happen, the people believed. They were excited that God had looked on their affliction. They bowed their heads and worship. That's how chapter four closes. Now Moses and Aaron go into Pharaoh. And don't you know they're excited? The people of Israel had heard about the rescue plan of God. They had seen or heard the demonstrations of power. And now Moses and Aaron are going to Pharaoh. They walk up to the palace. They're going to have an audience with him. And here's where everything is supposed to get exciting. And the deliverance is going to occur. They go to Pharaoh and they say to him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, what's he going to say? Who is the Lord? Who is this that you're talking about, that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. He's saying, I don't know this Yahweh, this Jehovah that you're talking about. You can even imagine him saying, you know, I know this God and I know that God, but I don't know the God you're speaking of. Why should I let these people go? And again, Moses and Aaron say, no, listen, the God of the Hebrews has met with us and he says, let us go. Let us make this journey. It's like a test to see if Pharaoh will do it. Now, God had already told him that Pharaoh would not. But the king of Egypt did not agree. The Pharaoh did not agree. And he says something very insulting in verse 4. He says, wherefore do ye, Moses and Aaron, let the people from their works? Hey, you're encouraging my workers to be lazy. And then he says, get you back to your burdens. And he's really including Moses and Aaron in this. He says, yeah, you're a couple of Hebrews. Get back to your work, you slaves. Now, after this is done, Pharaoh adds insult to injury, or we can say injury to the insult. Because what Pharaoh does in, in chapter 5, beginning at verse 5, Pharaoh says these people are growing and they're resting from their burden. So he calls the taskmasters and he tells them, you will give the people, as they're making their bricks as part of their slavery, no more straw, but instead they're going to have to seek out their own material to reinforce the bricks. But they're going to have to do just as much work, if not more. So this word goes out to the taskmasters, and you can see it repeated in the chapter. The Israelites, the Hebrews, are told that they are going to have to do more work in the same amount of time, making the same amount of products, and life is going to be more difficult than them, for them. And as this happens, they start to suffer and things are going worse and going badly. And the Hebrews are getting more and more upset because now life is worse for them than it was before. 
They're miserable. And what's the cause of this? Because that stupid Moses and Aaron came out of the desert telling us God was going to rescue us. And now we're more miserable than ever. This is what the Hebrews are probably thinking. Verse 19, the officers, the elders, the leaders of the children of Israel did see that they were in an evil case. Things were going bad for them. After it was said, you shall not minish or, or take away aught from your bricks of your daily task. You got to do your same work and you've got to even add the materials you need. And they met Moses and Aaron who stood in the way and they came as they came forth from Pharaoh. And they said unto them, the Lord look upon you. Basically, they're saying, God should look on you to curse you. They're basically cursing Moses and Aaron. The Lord look upon you and judge because you have made our savor. You've made us stink in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of his servants to put a sword in their hand to slay us. You're trying to get us killed. And Moses returned on the Lord. And what does Moses say? By the way, you'll see this in the story of Exodus. The people will complain to Moses and Moses goes to God in prayer. And he says, God, what are you doing? The Lord returned, uh, Moses returned to the Lord and said, Lord, wherefore hast thou so evil and treated thy people, this people? Why are you doing this to your people? Why is it that thou hast sent me? What are you doing to them? And why did you send me to cause this mess? What are you doing, God? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in thy name, he's done evil to this people. Neither hast thou delivered thy people at all. You haven't done anything, Lord, that you said you would. Now, Moses, we have to say to his uh, guilt, did not listen well, apparently, to God, because God had said, Moses, he's not going to let you go at first, but I'll show my power, and then he will. But I do want to say a good thing. You say, how, Pastor, how can you say a good thing in this bad moment? Well, the good thing is, when Moses had this struggle, he did not say, I quit. He did not say, there is no God. He did not say, I was mistaken. I had a hallucination in the desert. He goes to God in prayer and cries out to him. This is a great lesson from the Old Testament patriarchs, from Moses, even from the life of Christ, is that when faced with these challenges, they go to their knees in prayer. And brothers and sisters, when you're struggling this way, when the things you tried to do that were right turn out to be wrong, Go to God. It's fine to go to God and cry out and say, God, what, what's going on? And God reassures Moses. As this goes on in chapter 6, God basically repeats and reiterates the promise of what he's going to do. We won't read it for the sake of time today, but you can read how God says, listen, I will bless your people. I'll take them out of the land. I will show with a stretched out arm and great judgments, and people will know that I am God. You are my people. So God reassures Moses. This kind of echoes what we saw before about the internal struggle, doesn't it? But brothers and sisters, this is a challenge that we sometimes face. You're trying to do what's right and things go wrong. Now you say, well, well, good. I'm glad we got that out of the way. God's finally going to let Moses shine. He's finally going to show his people who God really is. But you know what? Chapter 6 and 7, now we have what I call the challenge of results. Maybe in your mind, you're thinking, if you're listening carefully, aha, Moses and Aaron did not show the power of God yet. As soon as they do that, it's really going to get Pharaoh. It's really going to cause him to see what was happening here. Now, in chapter 6, there's a genealogy to tell you who Moses and Aaron are. It gets to the end of the chapter, and, and Moses says back to God again, Lord, I'm not confident in myself, in my mouth, and my lips. And now... God reassures Moses one more time, and Moses goes in before God. Let's look down in our Bibles in chapter 7, verse 10. Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord had commanded. Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. And now we think, here it is. Now we're going to get to see the Pharaoh being scared and letting the people go. But what does it say in verse 11? Now, in, in the movies, if you've watched it about Moses or if you've read dramatic stories, maybe you think about Pharaoh being terrified and the magicians coming to help. But instead, it's quite casual in our Bibles. Verse 11, Pharaoh also called the wise men and their sorcerers. You can imagine Pharaoh kind of snapping his fingers, saying, come here, come here, magicians. I've got a little job for you. 
And now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. For they cast down every man his rod. They threw down all their rods and they became serpents. Now I have no idea what happened here. I'd love to see it. You'd love to know if this was some kind of really a uh, human magic trick of the eye or whether somehow through occult and satanic powers, they also did this type of uh, wonder. Because remember, the Bible does say that in the last days, there will be people who work lying wonders. That means miraculous things, amazing, magical, supernatural things that are truly supernatural, but they're not of God. So it seems like that's probably what happened here. They became serpents, but verse 12 says, Aaron's rod, the, the snake, swallowed up their rods, their snakes. So God showed himself to be victorious and greater than their magic, than their supernatural acts. God is the greatest. Now, when that's all done, is that it? Is Pharaoh going to finally will, be willing to let the people go? Look what it says in verse 13. And he hardened Pharaoh's heart. This is God. And he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. Now, we'll talk about this perhaps later on when we use this word harden once again. Pharaoh was always, excuse me, already uh, resentful and set in his ways to not let the people go. And what God does here is he confirms him in that condition. And Pharaoh will not let the people go. So that's why I call this the challenge of results. Things go nowhere when you start what you should. And this is also discouraging. Think about the burdens and the discouragement now in Moses's heart. What are we going to say about this? What, what's going forward now? Well, God has allowed Moses, as I say here, to appear and seem small, even like a failure, to be resented by his people before he's going to be seen as great and celebrated. God is setting the scene to show his mighty power. And this is how God delights to work. Now, again, for Moses in his life, we see some good things in his life. We see that he cared about the people. He had sympathy or empathy. We saw that early in his life. He's got humility in his life as well. He doesn't think that he's the perfect person to do this stuff. But God, I really think, is using the struggles in his life to make him more and more who he should be. He was meek. And the internal struggles, by the way, help him to be meek because he knows he's not perfect himself. We can see from this short little story today Moses was not a perfect, sinless man, and yet God was going to call him to a life of faithfulness, and God was going to call him to go on and show people how to live in a holy way. He also had to face great resentment and great resistance, great frustration in his work, and so Moses knew quite well from the beginning that things did not always go well. And praise God, he always has recourse. He always goes back to God. So for you and for me, remember, belonging to God and being God's servant as Moses was, and we Christians are, it doesn't mean we're not going to face struggles. It doesn't mean you're not going to face internal struggles. And it also doesn't mean you're not going to face external challenges. But God can be using these things to mold us and mature us as we go through them to make you and me the men and women we're supposed to be. God is able to, as, as my old pastor used to say back in the United States, use sin sinlessly. When I sin, when others sin, God can even use that to make us what we ought to be. Now, we should add this, by the way. It's much better to obey God and, and to not cause him to be angry than to have to suffer for it, right? Zipporah had to suffer for it. Moses nearly got killed. He had to suffer for it. Uh, he, God was angry with him in the, the burning bush incident towards the end. But listen, even when you've made a mistake, even when you haven't been obedient, maybe you're listening right now and you need to make a change. You need to repent and come back to God in faithfulness and you're worried about it. If I confess, if I make things right, then I, I'll be seen as a failure. No, listen, as you get restored to God, God can even use your mistakes to humble you and prepare you for service. So I hope that encourages those of you who are listening. And lastly, very simply, God's power is often shown in the midst of our weakness. You know, by the end of this, Moses is probably saying more than ever, Lord, I can't do it. My lips don't work right. My tongue doesn't work right. I try to show your power and it doesn't work. But he's going to find when he's at his weakest, 
that God shows his strength in the greatest. This is what Paul said in 2 Corinthians, didn't he? He said, you know what? As for me, when I am weak, then I am strong. Christ's strength is made perfect in my weakness. Praise God for these lessons from Moses' life. For you, whether you have struggles on the inside, whether you have struggles on the outside, God is able to use these things to make you and me into the men and women that he desires us to be as long as we keep going back to God in either confession, in confusion, and, and calling out to God for wisdom and direction in these changes and these struggles in our life. Let's do this now. Father, thank you so much for your word to us from the life of Moses. Thank you for the example of his life, Lord, that you allowed us to see his struggles. Uh, Father, in some places where he did not understand and you reassured him. Father, in places where he sinned and he did not obey you. And Father, we even get to see how you chastened him. Help us to, Lord, avoid that chastening by obeying you. But Father, help us also to see that you can use these things to make us into who you want us to be as we try to be more faithful to you. Father, also when we face struggles on the outside, resentment, Lord, and things don't work out as they should, please help us not to give up and throw in the towel as it were, but Lord, help us to go back to you in prayer and, and call out to you as these things are painful. But Father, help us to understand that just because we have some delay, just because we have some difficulty, it doesn't mean that you're done with us. So help us to, to see that, Lord, help us to realize and help us, Lord, not to faint in the day of adversity. These things are too hard for us because naturally, Lord, we give up. So give us supernatural grace and help us to be encouraged by your word. Help us to go on to serve you in great faithfulness like your faithful servant Moses. We pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.